Hello, everybody. Welcome to this web lecture tonight on the healing power of stillness. I'm Laurie Snorik Yates, and we'll be spending a little about an hour together tonight talking about stillness and how it has impacted healing in my own life. And I'll just be sharing some stories with you. And I hope that as you're listening, that you all hear in your own heart just something speaking to you about this practice of being still and finding healing in your own lives. Before we get going, I just have a few logistical points. Hopefully you're all hearing me okay and um, tuned in and everything. You should be able to toggle between seeing me speak and seeing the slides that I'm going to show shortly. So when the slides are in full screen, if you there's going to be a little box probably in the upper right hand corner and you can play around with that box and it will either bring the speaker into full screen if you prefer that view or it will keep the slides in full screen and have a little box of the speaker so you can play around with how you would like to view the web lecture this evening just a few other points you'll notice hopefully on your screen that there's a question and answer box and it's great if you can type in your questions during the web lecture at any point, or if you have comments or anything like that. Near the end, we will have some time for some interaction with um, questions. So please just, you know, any comments, any questions that you have, go ahead and chat them into the question and answer box at any time during the web lecture. And then the final note is that you're also going to see at some point a chat box come up on your screen. At the moment, you should not be able to see it, but um, I will open it at different times and invite you all who are, who are on the computer to chat in your answers. So for example, if there's a group of you in a home somewhere watching together tonight, um, whoever's near the computer can just kind of type in your responses to the questions. And sometimes there's a little delay, so we'll just be patient with the technology and we'll have a little bit of back and forth throughout the web lecture tonight. I first wanna welcome all of you who are on the phone. There's a large group of people on the phone tonight, which means that you, we won't be able to hear you, but you can certainly hear um, what I'm saying. And I'll be repeating what people are chatting in um, into the chat box. So you'll get to participate in that way. So <clears throat> without further ado, let's get started. And we'll be talking tonight about the healing power of stillness. Thank you to the um, church members who have sponsored this talk tonight. They um, are from Bel Air, Maryland, and they have put together and sponsored this event for all of you who are joining in on the web and via the telephone. So as I mentioned, to start off, let's just think about listening to your own heart speaking tonight. As I'm sharing from my heart, my stories, things that I'm talking about, if you, as you're listening, just pay attention to what messages are coming to your inspiration in your own heart, because that's the real message of this lecture, of this talk that you need this evening. Now, we're going to start with a story. And the story takes place in Sarajevo. We're going to go back in time a little bit to 1992. And it's a story of a cellist who comes into the middle of the central square of Sarajevo and plunks down a plastic chair and a cello case. And he sits down in the chair and he starts to play the cello. And behind him in the backdrop of the square, there's artillery shells falling on buildings and people are running for cover because it's the start of the Bosnian Civil War. Now, this cellist doesn't just come to the square this one time and play cello, but he comes back for 22 consecutive days. And in that time when he comes, he, he's commemorating the 22 men, women, and children that were killed in a bread line at the start of the war. Now, this story, when I first heard it, got me thinking about what it would really take to be there in the middle of this square with all of this conflict and challenge happening 
but yet to bring all of that peace and all of that goodness and to be able to play the music right there in the middle of the square. What kind of stillness would it take inside to be able to sit in the middle of that conflict zone and be able to share a piece of cello music? And that's the question for us tonight because most of us will not be in that situation where we're bombarded with physical violence around us on a regular basis. But whatever's bombarding our thought on a daily basis, the question for us tonight is, can we maintain that sense of deep, settled calm and stillness, even while things are very turbulent around us or very difficult or challenging or pulling us in many different directions at once? Can we bring stillness to all of that activity in a way that brings healing? And that's the question that we're going to look at. We're going to start by looking at what kind of stillness, what is this stillness exactly? And how do we maintain it? And I'll just show you, I'll just pull up a picture here of the cellist for you that of Sarajevo, you, you should be able to see it on your screen now, the story of the cellist in Sarajevo. And I think that as we think about this story of this man, you know, right in the center of Sarajevo and all that he's um, surrounded by, it just can really help us to keep perspective tonight on this topic that, that stillness is not about trying to escape from our environment to find peace. That stillness is what we find right in the midst of whatever might be going on around us, whatever might be turbulent or difficult or challenging. Or even sometimes we have so much good activity going on that we just don't know how we're going to have time for it all. So whatever whatever the activity might be, whatever the demands on our lives might look like. The question is, can we maintain that same sense of deep settled peace and calm, no matter what might be going on around us? Now there's an analogy that I like to think about with, with this idea of stillness. And it comes from sitting in my daughter's violin lessons and my son's cello lessons over many, many years. I have two musicians in the family. And one of the things that it makes me think about is, so well, here, so the analogy is this basically. So every time my daughter would go into her violin lesson, the first thing that she would do would be to tune her violin. And to do that, she, the, the teacher will put on a tuner with a pure, perfect tone. And then my daughter would start to play her violin. And inevitably as she plays the same tone on her violin, it's out of sync with the tone that's pure and perfect coming from the tuner. But rather than reacting or getting upset or, you know, this is a regular part of, of practicing an instrument is learning how to tune. You have to tune every day when you sit down to practice. And so she's very used to, to getting her instrument into tune with the right notes. So as my daughter's listening carefully to the, to the tone coming from the tuner, she will start to turn the little tuning knobs on the violin. If you look at the photo you can see in front of you, there's, there's these little tiny fine tuners down at the bottom, near the bottom of the instrument. And, and as you rotate those little fine tuners, the instrument comes into line with that pure, perfect tone. And to me, that's what stillness is like. That, that sometimes our lives get just kind of out of sync with the harmony of divine lo love, the harmony of divine life, that maybe we just aren't even used to thinking about divine love or divine life, that we're, we get into a rhythm sometimes of really thinking about life as all the stuff we have to do, or maybe the things that we wish we were doing, or the people we wish we were doing them with, or maybe there's things in our life that feel like a void or an emptiness. But whatever it is that might be our, our specific challenges on any given day, maybe it's listening to the news and finding that we get agitated about what's going on in our country. But whatever it is that might be challenging us, that stillness asks us to, to see our lives from that place of deep quiet and from that place of alignment, of aligning ourselves with God with divine love so perfectly that 
just like in that cello lesson or that violin lesson with my kids, when the instrument is perfectly in tune with the tuner, it sounds like there's only one note being played. You can't hear the distinction between the tuner and the instrument. And that is what our lives are like. That as we spend time fine tuning ourselves into the rhythm of the universe, the rhythm of divine love and of God, what happens is we feel a oneness with God that rather than feeling like we're these little mortals down here on earth, trying to struggle through our challenges in our lives and healing different issues in our experience or working really hard to earn a living and so on and so forth, that we start to feel this vibrant sense of vitality, of living in spirit, living surrounded by and completely coming out from God. And that brings a harmony to our experience and a peace that no matter what we have to face on any given day, it gives us the courage to face it. It gives us the sense that we're not walking alone and, and hoping that there's some divine God out there that will come and intervene, but we feel the oneness that can characterize all of our activity. And that, that is what the stillness is really all about. That's what we're looking for when we're, when we're getting quiet and looking to experience that sense of stillness is that oneness, that alignment. And sometimes it just takes a little fine tuning of our own lives to realize how we can be in that place of being at one with God. Now, the next quote you see on your screen is um, by a woman named Pam Brown. And she says, at the center of the most turbulent heart, there is a place of peace, a place beyond time that cannot be touched by change or loss. No tumult can disturb the quietness. No shadow can dim the light. Here in this stillness is rest and healing. Nothing we suffer, nothing that we fear can damage its perfection. Can you hear in that how this sense of stillness is really already within each heart, each one of us? I know that when I started working on this topic of being still and finding stillness in life, that it, it, it was tempting to think that it would be easier if I could just move out of, of sort of the busy city where I lived and kind of go to the mountains and just have a beautiful little mountain chalet somewhere and just kind of watch the wildlife and hike all, all day long and, you know, have this really quiet, secluded time, you know, at least, at least on the weekends, maybe, or at least regularly. And, and while those times are really nice, and for those of you that may have a place like that, that you go to in your lives, that's, that's a, a wonderful gift. But what I've also realized and come to realize is that as beautiful as those moments are, that it's in bringing that, the substance of those moments back into our daily lives that is the challenge. It's taking the goodness and the joy and the peace and the delight and the, the quiet in our thoughts and practicing that in the middle of the busiest day that we may have. And that that's the real challenge. And that the reason we can do it is because the stillness is already part of our true character and nature. That each one of us is created with, with a character and a divine nature that is already at one with God. That is already still and calm and peaceful. And that what we're looking to do is just tune ourselves in to that reality to that concept of ourselves and it means that all that noise that kind of goes on in our heads on a daily basis all the conversation all the talk and so forth that we're looking to really quiet the the running thoughts so that we can access that place of deep settled calm in ourselves but the good news about it is that it's already part of us and so we don't have to go looking for it elsewhere so as we talk about stillness tonight, just keep that, as, as we keep that idea in mind that the stillness we're all seeking is, is something we already have and that we're looking to discover it, that as the process of doing that is what 
puts us in sort of in, in a accord with the experience of healing that he, the healing aspect of stillness is not so much about changing something outside of ourselves, but about discovering what's already existent in divine reality. And we'll get more into that with a few stories tonight. But first of all, I just want to share with you kind of our, our couple keynote ideas. The talk is really based in this Bible verse that you might know very well. Be still and know that I am God. And I, I think the most important word in this phrase is the first one, which is be. That what we'll be talking about tonight and what we're, what we're talking about already, actually, this concept of stillness is a sense of being. It's a state of being. And I know that for me, it's been really easy to think of myself more as a human doing than a human being. But it's as we quiet all of the, again, all of that chatter that seems to kind of creep in on a daily basis. And, and for me, part of how to do that has just been to, a, a big step is just remembering to do it, remembering to take a moment during my day to quiet that, the, the constant chatter and to find and spend, you know, even just 15 minutes in that moment, in those moments of stillness. And it refreshes and renews and, and it just reminds me it's about how we're being that's really important more than what we're doing in life. The doing part's important too, but it happens more effortlessly and with more peace when we focus on the sense of being. And then, in, so everything you're gonna hear today comes from my practice of Christian science healing. And Christian science is a, a religion that was founded in the late 1800s here in Boston, Massachusetts, where I live, by a woman named Mary Baker Eddy. And she wrote a book called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, which is a book that explains the Bible. It's based in Bible text, and it's, it's an explanation of understanding about the Bible. And this is one of the things she wrote in her book. She said that we hear spirit or God when our senses are silent. You know, the senses are sort of everything we're perceiving, we're seeing with the eyes, we're hearing. It's also sort of all that chatter that kind of goes around in our thoughts, and that when we, when we get really quiet that that's where we hear God. These are the two books we were just talking about, the Bible and the Science and Health book with Key to the Scriptures, which is really the textbook of Christian science. And if anything you hear tonight sort of sparks your interest and you'd like to delve more into it, these two books are really where all the ideas come from for me. And you can find out more about them by um, just getting, you know, delving into the Bible yourself and reading on your own, but also um, purchasing the, the book Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures and sort of exploring the ideas in it. So tonight, our talk on stillness is, is going to focus on three main things. The first one is about practicing stillness for ourselves and finding peace with ourselves. The second part is going to be looking at how can, how can we practice being still and see healing results in our relationships with others. And then finally, how can we be still and maintain a sense of calm no matter what we're hearing going on in the world? And sometimes for me, that's the biggest challenge is not to feel agitated or ruffled or disturbed by things that might be going on um, that I might hear happening in the world around me. So for part one, looking at being at peace with ourselves, we're going to think about that sense of, again, be still and know that I am God. Now, how many different directives do you hear in that sentence? Be still, right, is the first part, and then know that I am God is that second part. So there's really two things that are happening here. So the stillness is really about sort of filling up with that concept of what God is. And in Christian science, when we talk about God, we're really talking about an understanding of universal, impartial divine love. Just like when the sun shines, it doesn't discriminate on a city and, and determine sort of which part of the city gets the better rays of the sun. And that's what God's love is like. It doesn't really matter what religion we come from, what kind of religious background we have, it doesn't matter if we had a turbulent childhood or a peaceful childhood or a wealthy upbringing or a poor upbringing. 
it doesn't matter if we consider ourselves a very religious person or spiritual person, or if we consider ourselves a, a, a really materialist person, it, what, what matters for this sense of God's love is really that it comes to us unbidden and we don't have to earn it or work up to it. We don't earn a place in God's kingdom that our, we, we already, each one of us is already worthy of understanding and seeing ourselves as, as that, as that um, sort of having a divine life that is bestowed upon by God that comes from that concept of divine love and universal love. And it doesn't mean that life is always easy, that understanding God as divine love doesn't mean we have a super easy life all the time, but what it does mean and what it can mean is that when we're going through a challenge, whatever we might be facing, that we have with us a sense of um, just that, that sense of calm that we can bring to whatever it is that we have to face in our daily lives. So now we're just going to do, um, I take a minute here to have a little interaction. So I'm going to turn on, um, just, I'll just turn on the chat box here for a second for you. And if you can just, um, if you're by a computer, go ahead and, and uh, get ready to type in the chat box. And you should be seeing where it says chat um, on your screen. And there should be a little box. If you type, if you go right there, you'll see where you can kind of chat in some ideas. So, and here's the question as we're talking about finding stillness within ourselves. The question is, what does it look like for you to feel at peace with yourself? So how do you know when you're truly feeling at peace? What does it look like? What characterizes it for you? So for example, for me, one of the things that really shows me that I'm feeling at peace with myself is that I'm no longer, I'm no longer sort of quick to judge others. That, that what might sort of annoy me or kind of grate on me at some times that that I just sort of lose an interest in, in judging or kind of condemning myself or others. And that's when I, I get a clue that I'm, I'm kind of feeling, just really feeling that sense of peace. So I hope you guys are finding the chat box. Go ahead and um, see if you can, as we're talking, just go ahead and kind of chat some of your ideas into that chat box and I'll just share them with those on the phone and others around. So one person wrote that for them, when they're really feeling at peace, they know that they're really listening for ideas from God. So there's that quality of, of listening and that quality of oneness, really, that um, being at peace is feeling the oneness with God. Excellent. All right. Um, oh, well, someone else wrote, when they're truly at peace, the what ifs disappear, right? So, you know, what if this happens? What if this happened? Um, that's a great, that's a great example. Thanks for sharing that, Kathy. Um, you know, and I think that part of what that is for me too, when the what ifs disappear is that it says that we're willing to be rooted in the present moment, that we're not going over and over and ruminating over and over about something that happened in the past that we wish was different, as tempting as that can be sometimes. We're also not focused so much on the future and concer concerns or worries about what might be or what might happen, but we're really just enjoying the, the present, enjoying the moment fully in the present. Um, someone else mentioned, um, Joni mentioned feeling joy in your heart. I love that, Joni. That's great. And joy to me is such a sense of being at peace. Um, one way that I characterize that sense of joy is when I feel like I'm just smiling for kind of no reason. Um, there's sort of this sense of just being kind of in love, but in love with just life and feeling connected to others in a different way than you might on a, on a daily basis. Um, I, I, I practice that a lot when I drive in traffic in Boston. Um, and I've actually been on a sort of a, a whirlwind tour for the last month. So I've been very free of having to drive in Boston traffic for a month, but Typically on a daily basis, I'm often um, driving around my children or friends or myself in Boston traffic. And it's a great practice for me in those moments to really 
apply that sense of, of being at peace and seeing the connections um, rather than just feeling like I'm getting through it or gosh, I just want to get there and get out of the traffic, but to feel that sense of joy and care, let stillness characterize the experience rather than annoyance or agitation or impatience or any of those other things that that just don't bring us forward in any way. All right, well, thank you for um, adding a little bit to the chat. I'm just gonna open up again the, uh, uh, the presentation here and let's see if we can get, um, we will just make, see what we have on our list here that we didn't um, talk about yet. So the, you know, we talked a little bit about the joy. Um, there's that sense of harmony, seeing oneness, loving, not judging others, a sense of, oh, there's also a sense of trust for me that when I'm feeling truly at peace, there's a willingness to let things unfold rather than having to make them happen. And it means that rather than feeling sort of in charge or that we're the ones that are responsible for the success of every endeavor, it really takes it off of us and um, lets us participate in a way that we can see the way the good is unfolding. There's a deep sense of calm and we lose an interest in, in rehearsing conflict, I think at that point when we're really at peace. And then the last one is just satisfaction, really living in that present moment that we talked about. Okay, so now, um, just think for yourself for a minute to for this next question. And the next question is, where are you looking to find this sense of peace in your life? Maybe personally, or, you know, where do people in general look for this sense of peace? And so some of the examples that have come up um, in different talks or in my practice with patients or in my own life are, you know, in relationships with others, especially with family, colleagues, in our finances, really finding peace with, with our finances, um, maybe politics, government, what's going on in the world, career issues, family issues, uh, with parenting, world events, busy schedules, and with health. Um, church isn't on there, but church could easily be added to that list. So whatever it is that, that we're looking, you know, where we're looking for peace. So on your screen, if those of you are looking at the screen, or if you're not, there's two columns. And in one side, you've got these qualities of what, what it means to be at peace, harmony, love, joy, trust, calm, satisfaction, living in the present, letting things unfold, et cetera. And on the right-hand side, you have a list of sort of where you wanna see those qualities in action in life. And I'm just gonna go through a story now and I'll just um, tell this brief story of healing um, and how these kinds of two um, aspects of life, sort of the places we want to see peace expressed and the qualities of the sense of stillness or peace, and how they work together for me. And for me, it was an experience I had a couple of years ago where I was in a just experiencing a heck of a lot of stress in my family life, um, in my work life. I had a, a long to-do list and it just seemed like no matter how much I would try to get done on any given day, at the end of the day, I was going to bed and I still had so many things left on the list. So each day I just kept waking up feeling this, like I, my day was already feeling burdened by all the things I had to do. And near the, um, it got near the holidays and I had family coming into town. And I, I was just, I really was working on um, trying to, to still sort of calm the sense of stress and, and burden, but it had kind of crept in a bit. And one morning, a couple of days before the family was arriving um, and all the activity was starting, I woke up and I hadn't slept very well and I had a really stiff neck and shoulders. And as I start off every morning in prayer, um, I did as well this particular morning. Um, but as I was praying, I could feel that the, the, the main focus of my prayer was just in wanting the pain to go away so that I could get a lot of things done. And I found myself almost feeling like that I was, I was the one, just like I was feeling in charge of getting my household ready and all my work projects and much, much of the family activity and all the things going on in my, in my family life. I started to feel, I, I kind of had taken on my prayer work. And in Christian science, prayer is, is a lot about listening for God's voice 
and understanding a sense of what is going on spiritually as opposed to what might be what we might be perceiving um you know sort of with our senses or as we talked about earlier or kind of quieting all the chatter about life and really hearing the divine message from god so that's what i was attempting to do with the prayer and i and and in those moments where we feel like our our lives align with god like like the instrument that tunes in to the perfect tone in those moments we is where we experience healing. So that's what I was, that's what I had experienced before. And that's what I was looking for. But in hindsight, the way that I started off praying was, was really about healing the pain and changing the physical condition of my body so that I could get on with my day. That's kind of subtly what crept into my thought when I was starting to pray. And as a result, I kind of took on the healing as if I was sort of feeling in charge of it as well. And God and this concept of God was kind of like off to the side, sort of like God was like this divine assistant that was going to help me have this experience of relief from pain so I could get on my day with my day. Well, needless to say, that was not effective. So I went throughout the day and was really uncomfortable, tried to get a lot of things done. But by the end of that day, I wasn't feeling any better. And the next two days went on like this until I woke up on the third morning and I still hadn't been sleeping well and hadn't been able to really find that sense of calm and stillness that I was so craving. And by the third morning when I woke up, it had gotten so excruciating that even taking a step was, would send these shooting pains up the back of my neck and on my shoulders. And I couldn't turn my head one even, even just a millimeter to the side. So I found that to, with, to avoid the pain, I had to like completely lie still or just sit up completely still and not move. So I was, I told my family, I just had to stay in bed. I couldn't, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't do anything that day. And this was a source of distress because I really wanted to be getting everything ready for our experience with the family members who were coming into town that day. But it was really a forced sense of having to be still. And as I, I quieted everything, as I, as I really practiced trying to quiet all that chatter in my head and all the angst about what I wanted to get done. And, and it was, again, sort of as we think about prayer as, as aligning ourselves with God's voice, Jesus gave us that great directive in the Bible about go into your closet and shut the door and pray to your father, pray to God in secret. And, you know, I find sometimes it's just the shutting of the door that can take, you know, multiple days at times to really get that door all the way shut. And that's what was going on for me this particular day. So that as I was trying to quiet all of the, all of the the conversation going on for in my head, slowly what happened is I started to feel a, a sense of just kind of, um, yielding to what God wanted for the day, as opposed to what I wanted for the day. And at the same time, I heard a clear message that came from God that said, I am the shepherd. Now I hadn't been thinking about shepherd or sheep, but this particular thought really kind of stopped me in my tracks. And it got me thinking about what that relationship was all about, the shepherd and sheep relationship. And I realized that most of my life, I actually didn't really have a ton of respect for the the sheep, the the idea of the sheep, because I had grown up thinking that it was much better to be a leader than a follower. I had grown up thinking it was much better to be, um, to, to take initiative rather than to just be passive. And so with all of these good characteristics and qualities that I felt like I had grown up with, what had happened is I, I could see how I was feeling that I was putting myself and my efforts at the center of even the healing work, as opposed to really keeping God and the concept of divine love at the center of my life. And that's what that message taught me, that I needed to flip my understanding of myself and my relationship to God. And I started to see how I had to appreciate the qualities of the sheep. So if you're near your chat box, I I left it open, I think. So go ahead and just, I'd love to see what you all think are the good qualities of the sheep. So go ahead and chat into the chat box. What are the qualities of the sheep that you think are important in this scenario? 
of being a sheep with God as the one shepherd. So someone said meekness, right? That's a great quality of the sheep. And Mary Baker Eddy talks about meekness as an armor. So rather, it's not a weak thing. It's actually a powerfully strong thing to be really meek. Um, it goes along kind of with obedience, you know, really follow, the sheep follow the shepherd, wherever the shepherd goes. Someone else said trust. Um, the sheep trust the shepherd impeccably. Um, a sense of listening, right? The sheep are always listening for the shepherd's voice. And they know the shepherd's voice better than anything else. They can distinguish their shepherd from any other voice. Someone said a willingness to follow the shepherd's lead. That's great. That sense of willingness as opposed to a willfulness, right? That when the shepherd says, let's go here, the sheep don't say, no, we don't feel like it. You know, they, they are willing to follow. Um, there's a sense of innocence, right? Someone um, chatted in that, that quality of innocence, which I just love the sense of innocence about the sheep. Um, and also the trusting aspect of the sheep. Um, someone told me, once that you may know this, that um, sheep will only drink if the water is still. I just, I love that concept. And so they're trusting that the shepherd will lead them to where they can be nourished and, and replenished and refreshed. And I just love that sense of, um, of trust and, and willingness. So these are sort of a lot of the qualities that I began thinking about that particular day. And at first it was easy to feel like I had not been I, I didn't have any of those qualities. At first, it was easy to feel like I had to kind of work really hard on myself to get these qualities, and then maybe I would have a healing of the pain. But slowly, as I started to understand this relationship of, of God to each one of us, what it says is that as we understand ourselves to be the outcome of God, because each one of us is actually the outcome of divine love of God. We are what God is doing. And as I started to, as, as that started to dawn on me, that there's this unbreakable relationship between this force, this power, of, which is God of love and each one of us, which is like the rays from the sun to God, that we can't actually in reality, in spiritual reality, we cannot possibly get separated from God. We can't there can't be a gulf between us and God. It can't, it can't be that God is off to the side and we're kind of here trying to do our best, hoping God will intervene. That the reality of, of the relationship is this unbroken connection between the creator and creation, God, the creator, and each one of us, the creation. And as that relationship started to dawn on me more fully through this idea of sheep and shepherd, I realized how it was impossible that those qualities could be absent from any one of us. And as I started to understand more about letting God shepherd me, I could feel my whole body and my whole being just relaxing and feeling a deep settled sense of calm. And at the same time is when the pain started to diminish to the point where I could start to turn my head again and I would, and I, the, you know, my shoulders were freed up and I could go down and join my family for the holiday celebrations. What was interesting about it is that the next morning when I woke up, the very first thought before I could even consciously think about God or pray or have some quiet time was this fear that the pain would be back. And, and so, I, you know, as I started to move my head and then I found the pain was gone, it was full, it was completely gone. Um, I was a little bit surprised at first because I had gotten so used to the pain for the, the few days that it had been there. And what I realized is that healing is not dependent on our own, our own mind. That as, as, it, as we yield our own thoughts, our own will, our, you know, to, to understanding that reality of divine presence, things shift and they, and they don't go back to where they were that if it seems like they go back to where they were, that it's, it's really, they, they are, um, it's an opportunity to, for us to sort of more deeply understand that relationship between us and divine presence and God. And so even though I was sort of expecting the pain to be there, thought had shifted and, and I had already understood 
a new concept of myself and my relationship to God that that moved me beyond the pain and the physical situation. So at any rate, that whole experience for me of was one of of shifting from keeping from from realizing that healing is about discovering that unbroken relationship to divine love. And that when we glimpse that in those moments of being still, that's where we realize healing has already happened. We're not trying to make it happen. We're, we're like aligning ourselves with the reality of what's already true. So um, I'm just going to show you another quick, uh, quick um, little slide here. So this is just something funny that I found recently that, um, that I love. And it talks, there's a shepherd that's saying, that says, um, so it's a picture of a shepherd and a sheep. It's a little cartoon. And the sheep is holding like a, a little cell phone device. And the shepherd is standing in front of the sheep and the sheep is hanging out by the, by the, uh, by the tree. And the shepherd's saying, you can't unfollow me. I'm your shepherd. And I just love this sense of that unbroken relationship, that it's not possible to disconnect from the shepherd. And of course, the, there's a play on words that trying to that the sheep is trying to unfollow the shepherd, you know, like people unfollow each other on social media or whatever. But at any rate, this idea we can't actually get outside of that relationship with God. And no matter how much it seemed like I was struggling on my own, that as I as my life kind of aligned itself and tuned in to what God was, that that's when the the difficulty be, diminished into nothing. So Mary Pigretti wrote um, this statement. She said, there is a rest in Christ, a peace in love. The thought of it stills complaint. The heaving surf of life's troubled sea foams itself away and underneath is a deep settled calm. And I feel like that's what happened for me that the thought of God, of this peace in love stilled the complaint in the body. And and then I discovered that deep settled calm that was always present. All right, so we're gonna get through the last two sections here more, a little more quickly. And the first one is on relationships. And there's a passage from Psalms that I love that says, be still and seek God. And um, that's a little paraphrase, but the idea is of, of really seeking, seeking God on a daily basis and seeking that sense of divine presence and divine love. And, and I think that that's partly what being still is all about, that as we take time in our day to really pause and, and place our focus wholly and wholeheartedly on divine love and divine presence, that it changes the way we experience our day and experience relationships with others. I think it has a lot to do with what Paul said in many of his writings, which was that we have the mind of Christ. He said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And, and I, I think it's worth just taking a minute here to talk about like, what does this mean? What, is it, what does it mean exactly to, to have the mind of Christ? So just again, if you're near your chat box for a second, go ahead and just um, go ahead and chat in any of, you, any of your answers that you'd like to contribute. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Um, and there's just a brief story that has really been meaningful to me lately. It's the story of when Jesus comes with his disciples into Jericho and as so often happens in the Bible stories, Jesus arrives and there's a huge crowd of people and they're all following him. And they get to Jericho and there's blind Bartimaeus is down by the, by the side of the road and starts to cry out to Jesus to come and heal, heal him. And as he cries out to Jesus, the disciples tell him to be quiet, you know, stop being so loud. And every time he's quieted by the disciples, Bartimaeus just yells louder. And so you can picture the chaos, right? The scene. Everyone is clamoring for Jesus's attention. They want him to help them. They're, you know, wanting to, so they're all sort of clamoring for his attention, for his help. And it struck, it struck me in reading this story that Jesus didn't immediately run over to Bartimaeus and say, all right, be quiet. Everyone's getting riled up. Just be quiet and I'll heal you, right? In the Bible, it says Jesus stood still. And I love that. And it says this numerous times throughout the Bible, stand still and notice God. You know, it, it says it in Psalms and Isaiah and throughout the Gospels at different times. But this sense of standing still, to me, the mind of Christ is always at peace. 
always calm and still. Somebody else wrote that um, the mind of Christ is compassionate, right? To have the mind of Christ means to see with compassion. I love that. That's a great um, way of thinking about it. Um, someone else said to see only as God sees, to see only good. Um, that the mind of Christ gets its information, not from what it sees in front of it, but from what God, from the information God gives. And that for me is sort of this key to relationship. So let's just go back here um, for a second to our, our slides and we'll um, see what we, what we have here. But having the mind of Christ means, so just a few other ideas, that, that we bring stillness to all that we do. Someone mentioned compassion already. Thinking beyond ourselves, right, is what compassion is for me. That there's a sense of equality that we don't feel superior to others um, or inferior to others. That there's that we feel the sense of equality bringing us together through the mind of Christ. That we're God-centered. There's a oneness with divine presence and love, and that our thoughts come from God. Um, and this last one for me is is the key to this next story um, that I'll share with you. And it's a story of um, a friend of mine who was um, at home one day and she woke up um, in her house and she had this rash sort of covering her body. And her husband, she was, she was a Christian scientist, which means that she's been practicing spiritual healing for most of her life and finding relief and results through prayer and relying on studies of the Bible and of the Christian science textbook. But her husband, who was not a practice, not practicing Christian science, was kind of concerned for her and tried to help her a little bit by making some suggestions about how she may have gotten this rash, that maybe it was the fish they had had at the restaurant the night before, or did she, you know, did she change detergents in, in, on the sheets that she washed? And so maybe somehow there was some new chemical that might've been causing this particular reaction, et cetera, et cetera. And so as my friend was, was trying to kind of keep her thought still and get her thought very calm and still. Um, she was finding that these thoughts kept creeping in about why did this happen? Where did this come from? What's going on? Is this something really serious? You know, all of these thoughts were kind of swirling around in her head and she was worried and she was nervous for herself. She made a phone call to her sister and, and talked to talk through some of the issues that she was having and really um, was looking for that, that sense of peace. And her sister helped her with a few ideas and she lay down on the couch for a little bit, trying to quiet her thoughts and all the agitation and worry about herself and the irritation in her body. But she was having a difficult time finding stillness. Well, finally, later, it was late in the day at this point, it was after dark and her husband suggested that they go for a walk. She was still feeling a bit agitated, but she agreed and off they went out into their town. Now they live near this beautiful wide river and they had walked onto a bridge that overlooked the river in their city. And as they were sitting there just quietly and my friend was really wanting to, to pray and find stillness and, and peace and calm, that she noticed the reflection of the moon on the water. And the river was perfectly still and calm, at least at the surface. And the moon was beautifully reflected perfectly in the water. And then as she watched, this breeze came up and ruffled the surface of the water. And the moon looked like it split into a million little pieces, little fragments. And as she kept watching and slowly the breeze died down again and the, the surface of the water became very, very calm, the moon suddenly was back together again. And she looked up at the moon in the sky and she realized that, of course, what she was seeing was a distorted image of the moon, not the real moon itself that the moon hadn't changed or gone anywhere. It hadn't fragmented into a million pieces. It had stayed just as it was. And, and that it was this breeze that came through that agitated the surface of the water that distracted her from the true whole idea of the moon. Well, this idea was so arresting to her thought that she walked home thinking nothing more than just the, the perfect, idea of moon and how it was reflected wholly and completely and that the breeze was what tried to to make it look like it had shattered but that nothing had changed about the real substance of the moon and it got her thinking about herself as well 
that although she still had this rash from, you know, all over her body, that it was like she was staring at the fragmented image of that moon on the water and accepting that that was her reality. And what she started to feel was the peace of the, of the, and the confidence that the moon had not, had not um, fragmented and then mended, but that the moon had always been intact. And that when the breeze went away, you could see the clear vision again, the clear reflection of that moon. Well, she was so conscious of these ideas as true about her own body, her own self, her own identity, that she reflected the perfection of divine love. And that this breeze of a rash, this, this sort of um, distraction from that pure, perfect identity of God was didn't have anything to do with her true substance. She fell asleep thinking about these ideas and woke up the next morning with, with no rash, no signs of any irritation whatsoever. And what I love about this story is just the sense of the way that even when we start to, when we're speculating, we're wondering, we're trying to think about what could possibly be the issue here that we, we're dealing with, why did this come about, that in reality, we are that perfect reflection and that we have the same properties as divine love, as idea, and that it's in the quietness, it's when we get still that we see that glimpse and that reality of ourselves. So on the screen, you can see this quote from Isaiah, which I love, which is, in quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And there's a beautiful image that I took um, when I was out in Colorado of reflection. And you could see the surface of the water is so still, it's a little bit ruffled in the photo, but almost so still that you can see the perfect reflection of the trees um, reflected in the water. And that that is the substance of the reality of our unbroken relationship to God. And that knowledge and understanding is what aligns us with healing and allows the body to quiet itself and the complaint to vanish. Now, just briefly, I just wanted to share this idea with you from the Washington Post. There was an article oh, about a year or so ago, and um, it was written by a man named Jeffrey Redinger, and, and he shared some ideas about his medical practice. He's also He also has a degree in theology. And he's talking about people who've had um, recoveries from incurable illnesses, and their recoveries happened without any medical intervention. And he says that he's identified in over a hundred different cases like this, mental and spiritual principles that are associated with their recoveries. And that he was advocating that we start to look into and explore how people are recovering from incurable illness without any intervention medically. Now I bring this up because this is the same question that Mary Baker Eddy had over 120 years ago. She had um, an incurable illness here in the Boston area. She'd had an accident. She was not expected to recover. Her friends and family had been preparing for her to pass on. And she was reading it in her Bible one day, a healing that Jesus um, performed in the Bible. And she felt this powerful sense of love come over her that gave her strength and renewed her completely and brought her health back. And she lived for many more decades after that. And she had that same question is, what, what went on here? What just happened here? And is there some way that we can practice this, not just for ourselves, but for others? She identified this concept of God as impartial universal love that comes to each one of us without even having to earn it. But just by aligning ourselves with that concept of divine love and divine love's understanding. And the sense of unity with divine presence gave her this sense and this concept that that as we live in that awareness of that unity, that we experience life from that place of stillness and healing, and that healing is natural. It's a natural outcome of understanding our true identity with God. So in thinking about that and thinking about how that's what occurred for my friend as she overcame her rash, that she was as she aligned herself with an understanding of, of herself as created spiritually that all of the worry and concern kind of faded away and was replaced by this sense of peace and calm. Now, the last part tonight for our talk is to look at how we can do this even in light of world events. 
And there's a, a passage in Psalms that just says, be still and commune with your own heart upon your bed, or be still and search your heart silently. And to me, that's really key in, in world events is that like Jesus standing still before he went and healed Bartimaeus, if we can kind of find that sense of standing still mentally, rather than letting ourselves float down the river with the current of thought going on in life, it helps us to be part of the solution. And here's a little story um, that has helped me think about this throughout time as well. And the story is, a, 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 it was a contest actually that occurred years ago for children. And these children were asked to draw their vision of what peace looks like. So all these children contributed their pictures to the contest and they chose one to be the winner. And the winning picture was of this huge rushing, roaring waterfall coming down and spilling into a pool below that was churned up and very turbulent. And the child had drawn this waterfall, but then the, the child had drawn behind the waterfall on a little ledge, a yellow canary. And the canary was pictured as singing. And what I love about this image, and think for yourselves, you know, what does this say to you about peace? Why was this the image they chose to characterize peace? But for, because for me, what it says is it, it gives a, an, an inkling of our ability to remain undisturbed. No matter how much turbulence might be happening around us, no matter what might be falling quickly over the waterfall or coming quickly through the news sources. I mean, today with social media, we have news coming at us, you know, 24 seven news reports, you know, day and night and whatever might be coming and spilling over that we're looking for our ability to be engaged, to be active, to be working towards finding that sense of peace in the world and not letting ourselves get bowled over by the waterfall, by the tumbling of, of all of the news. And one of the things that's really helped me in life with this is, is the Christian Science Monitor. It was founded by Mary Baker Eddy in the early 1900s at a time when there was a lot of fake news being produced, if that sounds familiar, here in the United States at least. And she wanted to have a news source that was focused on, on, on being a positive, um, having a positive impact on humanity so that it would injure no one, but bless or, or you know, sort of have this really constructive viewpoint for, for whatever might be going on. And what I, what I find about the Christian Science Monitor is that it's, a, it's an attempt to look at a news story and to not jump, I feel like for me, the monitor is, is like a news source that says, I'm not gonna jump in the pool and get all churned up with everybody else. I'm gonna be like that canary and I'm gonna sit on the ledge and I'm gonna look at what's happening. I'm not gonna ignore it. It's right next to me, but I want to find the conversation that's going on that we can start that's going to bring us into a new way of thinking that will ultimately change the world. And if any of you remember back in the day when um, Germany was divided into two countries, East and West Germany, and there was a wall between it. And I remember um, as I was studying peace building in college that I was talking with a woman who lived in um, East Germany during the time. And she said she prayed every day for 10 years, every morning for the wall to come down. And at the time, I think I was 20 or 21 and I, you know, praying for 10 years seemed unfathomable to me at that time in my life. And, you know, I just wondered, you know, how can you pray every day for 10 years and have hope that you're going to see results when it doesn't look like anything's happening? And what she said to me when I asked her that, she said, well, Laurie, what, she said, the wall came down in a day, but it wasn't the result of a day. She said, it was the result of all of the changes in consciousness that happened leading up to that ability to take down the wall. And then she said, and what changes consciousness? And it's the, it's the thought, as thought changes and as new ideas are accepted and understood and, and held, that's what chips away at kind of these mental blocks that would keep walls up between people or between nations or would keep violence being perpetuated in cycles generation after generation. That if we're looking to stop those things in their tracks, that prayer is not only effective, but it's an excellent strategy. First of all, it helps us 
to maintain ourself in ourselves that sense of calm that allows us to be part, to hear inspirations to be part of the solution. That when we're agitated or complaining or in angst, it's very difficult to hear inspirations for how to move forward constructively. But it's also that every single prayer, every single effort for us to feel, not just know intellectually, but feel peace about something that's tempting us to be really agitated, that every effort to do that chips away at the consciousness that or at, at chips away at the thought that would try to keep us divided and keep us stuck in a place of perpetuation of violence. So every prayer makes a difference. All right, so none of you have chatted in questions. So I will just, um, and we're getting near the end of our time, but um, sometimes one of the questions that I'm often asked in these talks is to talk a little bit just more about sort of how this concept of prayer works. So you'll see the question and answer box. If you have a last minute question, you can chat it in right now, but otherwise I'll just briefly speak about um, this concept of, of, of really getting still and feeling that uh, and feeling what it's like to pray in those moments of stillness. And for me, it's, it's really about sort of three different things that the first one is about remembering to get quiet that no matter how, and that the best time to find stillness is when we have too many things to do is when we don't have the time the days that we think we don't have the time to be still those are the days that we need it the most and i know for me in my life when i've taken those time those moments and just even for 5 10 minutes during the day and practice setting everything aside and just being still that and being still literally doing nothing not planning not thinking not you know worrying about the next moment but just quieting thought and feeling that that sense of oneness with god that it changes the way the rest of my day goes that that's the first step that the second step for me is just sort of really getting quiet quieting those thoughts and then and remembering to do that. And then remembering also to recognize my true thoughts, that they don't come from what I see in front of me. They come directly from God, like that mind of Christ. And then the third point, and I'm kind of getting to the summary here, but the, the third point for me about practicing stillness is, is, to, is to recognize that our mental, our mental concept on any given at any given point during our day that the the concept the mental concept we're holding about ourselves about our colleagues about the world and about world events that that is that science it's the science of being like we talked about in the beginning about be still that that we in that book we mentioned science and health with key to the scriptures by mary baker eddy there's a chapter called the science of being and i find that that reminder about how to be is so key for me to keep the focus on, on being as opposed to on the, on the human doing all the time. And that those three things, that just taking the time to really be still, remembering the origin of thought, that it comes from God, not from what I see in front of me. And then to finally just remember the focus is on how I'm being, to not get caught up in what might be going on in the world or in world events, but to maintain in myself the sense of good humor, of being relaxed, of being at peace, that those things tune us, are like the fine tuning aspects to keep us focused on healing and on what God is. And then finally, I'll just close with this quote and, and I'll, I'll keep the chat open for a few minutes and, and also the question and answer box. If for some reason um, you put your questions in the, the chat box or, or whatever, I'll just stay on for a few more minutes and ha be happy to answer questions, but I'll just close now for any of you that have to go. But Mary Baker Eddy wrote this about stillness. She said, mind revolves on a spiritual axis and its power is displayed and its presence felt in eternal stillness and immovable love. So thank you all so much for joining tonight, for being here and being part of this um, web lecture event sponsored by um, Bel Air Church in Maryland. And um, Again, if any of you have any last minute questions or comments that you'd like to put into the chat box, go ahead. I'll leave it open for a few minutes and I'll just be here to chat back with you. But 
otherwise I'll sign off now and say thank you for joining us tonight. And um, for anybody that may have registered but did not participate tonight, you you will, and, and those of you that did participate, there will be a recording of the webinar, the web lecture that will be sent out in a day or two um, in case you wanted to revisit anything or share it with anybody. Or um, if anyone didn't get to attend, they can watch the, um, the video follow up. So again, thank you all for joining and have a wonderful night full of stillness. Goodbye.